I believe that we are being misled, misdirected, deceived. And I believe that it's being done on purpose. See, we've had this conversation around Baldur's Gate 3 and the state of AAA gaming for quite a while now. Different content creators that are weighing in publications as well as different journalists. Sometimes even tweets. But the focus of the conversation continues to shift and it shifts away from the thing that is the most important part of the entire conversation and I believe that that's actually being done on purpose. Whether some people know it or not. See, Baldur's Gate 3 was a wake-up call. But it's not the first time that we've seen this. We saw the same thing with Elden Ring. A game that was released to high praise, reviewed well, and that the players loved. However, it was also a game that was highly criticized by developers and journalists. Judging the game on simple things like UI or its lack of direction in the world, regardless if the players loved those things or not. Elden Ring was a game that was both innovative in its game design and also in its world design. But more than anything, it was a game that provided a significant amount of value to the player. And a dense amount of value at that. And that's the word that we keep losing track of. Value. And that's the most important thing to us. Fast forward from Elden Ring to Baldur's Gate 3. A conversation has started about how AAA studios can't be held to the same standards as an independent studio. Journalists, PR agencies, and other institutions dogpiling on the consumer trying to suppress our outrage in response to the state of the AAA industry. Us asking why can't you make games like Larian does. And it's not as if we're trying to ask them to do anything new. We're just asking them to do what they used to do. Many of our favorite games, favorite franchises started out as Larian. Passionate studios working on something they love. Making games that they love playing. Making something that others wanted to enjoy. Blizzard, Ubisoft, EA, Microsoft, Take-Two, Bungie, and more used to be known as the companies that you could always buy something from, and more times than not, it was going to be one of your greatest experiences and a game of value. Recently, I've seen a few others cover an article from GameDeveloper.com titled Yelling is Not Journalism by developer and journalist Brandon Sheffield. This is in response to Devin Laguerre's video on IGN talking about the shakeup that Baldur's Gate 3 has caused in the developer community. Now, the point of this video isn't to pick apart the article, however, I just want to highlight some of the language that's being used, because it shows just how far we're getting from the root cause of the issue that's upsetting the customer to begin with, and I'm wondering if we're being misdirected on purpose. Sheffield's article opens up with, There was an opportunity to give players context for why games release the way that they do, but instead, it was designed to incite anger directed at a few devs. So Sheffield opens up with a straw man misrepresenting not only Devin Laguerre and IGN's video, but also the consumer outrage at the same time. Trying to make us out to be the bad guys, as if we're just directing this at people that are innocent and shouldn't be to blame for anything. But they know that's not the case. Our anger, our outrage is directed at the companies, not at the guys that are working at the desk. Furthermore, this also goes to show just the condescending nature of the industry to begin with. That we, the consumer, need to be educated on how games are made. And if we're educated, then we'll understand why we don't get finished products. Why we have to pay full price for an unfinished game. Why we don't get value for the money that we spend. No, we don't need to be educated. You need to give us what we paid for. That's it. How is this acceptable in any other industry? You don't go to a five-star restaurant, only get half of your food, and then you're expected to be understanding because, oh, well, there's only one cook that night. You don't go to buy a new car and you're told that, oh, we're still working on the seats and the radio. Don't worry, we'll release those to you later. Why is it the expectation that we must still pay full price for a game and also be understanding of the pressures of deadlines, funding, and investor constraints? Furthermore, why is our focus continuously being reverted to the polish of a game rather than the value that the customer receives from playing it? You can go to a five-star restaurant, receive half of the food that you would elsewhere, and still get the value for the food that you paid for. 
We see this in indie, single, and double-A games time and time again. Baldur's Gate 3 is a $60 game, yet it provides the customer with far more value than many of the games that the AAA industry has released over the last few years. And it doesn't ask us for any more money or make any excuses. Even when the conversation first broke out on Baldur's Gate over on Twitter, again, the discussion was boiled down to polish and scope rather than valuable experiences. Why did the players love Elden Ring? It's because they felt that their time was valued playing it. They felt like they got their money worth out of the money that they spent on the game. They had fun playing the game. Time and time again, we're told these PR lines from publishers and AAA developers. We're sorry. We're listening. We hear you. But they're not. Because if they were listening, then they would understand that we're not doing this just because we're trying to complain. No, we're doing this because we want to save them. They're the makers of some of our favorite games of all time. But the problem is, is that the more profit-driven that they become, the further they get away from the passion of making games in the first place. It's like a gem collector turned mining outfit. They used to do it for the love of the gems that they were collecting, but now they're just mining for every resource they possibly can get out of it. And now all they're going to be left with is rocks until the eventual collapse of the mine. Sheffield goes on to explain the rocks that we get, saying, in abstract, here's a big part of it. Games release in imperfect states because devs either run out of money or shareholders of their parent company mandate that the game must come out in a certain window, which devs have no control over. They run out of money trying to make the best game possible in the least amount of time. Devs rarely control their own budget and are trying to make as much cool stuff as they can with the time that they're allotted. In short, for one reason or another, they are often forced to start selling the game in order to pay for the completion of the game. This has been done through DLC, patches, early access, and yes, even microtransactions for ages because of rising expectations for AAA and because big studios are beholden to financial year results and reporting to their investors. Devs burn through their life force trying to make this happen, and it's upsetting to see this brought up with absolute incuriosity. And this is it. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This misunderstanding that we, the consumer, blame the developers that are working at the desk when, in fact, it's the company who we direct our dissatisfaction towards. We see it for what it is, productivity being pushed by overpaid CEOs and the shareholders they answer to that want to provide as little value as possible to the consumer for as cheaply as possible while also selling it for as much money as they possibly can. Now, even Sheffield is sold on the corporate narrative that it is our responsibility as the consumer to soak up the full game price so that they can finish making a full game later just to appease investors, make up for their poor planning, their misuse of resources, and their lack of vision within their leadership. Moreover, why are we giving microtransactions a pass? Like, oh, guys, you know, it's totally wholesome. They're just doing it because... They need to be able to fund the game and, you know, keep the servers up and things like that when we know that's not the case. Otherwise, if it was, then why are they using such manipulative tactics when they're using microtransactions in the first place? Things like loot boxes, locking valuable items behind battle passes, making some of the best cosmetics in the game only purchasable from the shop. They know the tricks that they're doing, obfuscating different currencies within the game from our actual dollar to make sure we don't know how things actually add up. If it was being done for such wholesome reasons, then why are you implementing it in such an unwholesome way? I think that's a word. If that's the case, then how about the $1.2 billion that Activision Blizzard made in 2021 on microtransactions alone? Did that money go into making Diablo 4 a complete game? Or Overwatch, for that matter? No, it didn't. I think Xbox perfectly encapsulates what's wrong with the gaming industry and how it's losing focus. Don't get me wrong. I love Xbox. I love Game Pass. I think it's one of the best things that the entire industry could do for consumers. However, Xbox is putting all of their focus into how they deliver games and stay ahead of the market rather than making sure that they are delivering high-quality games great games, and games of value. They chase the smoke of live service titles pressuring Arcane to make Redfall. 
they neglected the oversight of 343 working on Halo Infinite, just assuming that they would get it right even after consecutive failures to capture the magic of Halo. Think about that. They let Halo become an afterthought in the gaming industry, one of the most influential games of all time, the game that popularized FPS controls on a controller, a game that at one time was a pop culture phenomenon. And now what happened? How did that happen? Because they were more concerned with becoming the Netflix of gaming. And it's not just Xbox whose focus has shifted. It's almost every single AAA company. Epic Games doesn't even make games anymore. They just run off of the fumes of Fall Guys, Fortnite, and Rocket League microtransactions. EA pimps out every single game in their library outside of the rare gems like Jedi Survivor, It Takes Two, and the Dead Space remake. Ubisoft sells XP boosts in single-player open-world games. And don't even get me started on Activision Blizzard. That horse is beat so dead, so hard, that they call bug fixes Season 2 in Diablo 4. So while these companies continue to release unfinished games because they can't beat different deadlines that are set by their investors or time constraints or money constraints or whatever it is, while they continue to lose focus because they're paying attention to more profit-driven incentives than anything else, we, the consumer, have to soak up their misdeeds by paying into microtransactions, battle passes, and worse. And that's supposed to make our games better. But by the time any of these games actually do get to a playable state, or, God forbid, make them enjoyable, they're already almost coming out with the next game anyway. That doesn't seem like us helping to support them make better games. That just seems like us being taken advantage of. That seems like the consumer being programmed to continue to pay for things that we're not getting our money out of. And it's making it an expectation. How many times over the last few years have you expected a game to actually work day one on release without any issues? If you're anything like me, it's a flip of the coin. And when the coin landed on heads and it ended up actually working properly, it was a surprise. And I think to myself, maybe they got it figured out. But we know that's not the case. If Elden Ring was the flash of lightning, then Baldur's Gate 3 was the thunder that followed. A classic turn-based RPG dominated gaming headlines. It turned heads and it held attention. Reviewers applauding the game as a resounding success despite the lack of polish in the later third of the game. Why? Is the game that good that it's so far above everything else that we've ever seen? Well, that's something that's a matter of opinion. Personally, I think it's one of the greatest games that I've ever played. But I enjoy tactical combat, high fantasy, and optional multiplayer. But why did it reach such a wider audience? Simple. Widespread consumer dissatisfaction. Players are absolutely exhausted of live service models, in-game shops, buying skins, microtransactions everywhere in the entire game, unimaginative design, games constantly stealing the mechanics of another game. And while that's completely fine in some different ways, I feel like every open world game is an Ubisoft game now. You wonder why we love Elden Ring or Baldur's Gate 3 or Tears of the Kingdom. It's just because they're well-made, good games. It's as simple as that. There's no strings attached. It's not some crazy thing that you need to be able to divine. I've seen five or six different apologies from developers or publishers over the last year, just within 2023, trying to figure out, oh, guys, you know, we're, we hear you, we're listening, uh, uh, you know, we'll fix things, we promise. No, you're, you're not listening, because if you were, then you would understand why we are praising these games in the first place. It's just that they're really good games. That's it. And we just want you to go back to doing what you used to do, which is making really good games. You know, the thing is, is that they can't. And the reason why they're apologizing, the reason why they're running around with their heads cut off is because they are trying to constantly figure out ways to be able to match the monetization of the game with how the player is going to play the game, how we're going to enjoy it. Actman brought it up in a video of his. We talked about how Diablo 4, everything in the game has to be scheduled in a certain way, how fast we level up, how fast we find items, how fast we find gear that we like that looks on us. All of those things have to match the monetization, the battle pass, all of those things. They all have to coalesce and combine. 
And that's incredibly difficult to do, especially when you're trying to make something that's actually enjoyable to play. Earlier, I talked about how different institutions and publications or journalists were pushing back on the gamers and our outcry and our outrage and how they were dogpiling on us, dogpiling on our needs and the narrative of the pushback that we have against the profit incentives of these companies and how we want better games and more complete games. According to the business research company, the global microtransaction market will grow from $67.9 billion in 2022 to $76.6 billion in 2023, which is over 30% of the estimated $200 billion the gaming market will earn in 2023. It's really profitable being anti-consumer, especially when you start cost cutting and you're also not held responsible for the state in which your games are released. I mean, they have turned our understanding that creative projects are difficult to make and are iterative processes in their design and made it into a normalization that we must buy unfinished products and wait for them to patch it or release more content in the future. All the while, they're stealing resources from places where they need to go. And what customers really end up paying for is the 80 to $100 million that they're spending on marketing budgets for these AAA games. And it really doesn't help that our regulators, those in government, aren't working to protect the customer, mostly because either they're too old to understand or because they're incentivized not to through lobbying to protect the interests of investors and these large publicly traded institutions. Luckily, there are some countries like the Netherlands who are moving to ban things like loot boxes. And what's great about that is it makes it really difficult for these companies to be able to release their games in well, just about anywhere once other people start giving them even the slightest amount of pushback. By prioritizing profits, the makers of our favorite games, our most beloved games of all time, are losing touch with their customers. While they may not see the immediate effects of this because the silent majority continues to buy their games and interact with microtransactions, we're seeing a slow shift spurred by the vocal minority. When you see a classic RPG based on Dungeons & Dragons explode onto the market, breaking all-time records on Steam, you're seeing a greater shift in the market. Social media is much stronger than the AAA industry. Some of the most popular videos on YouTube and TikTok are those complaining about the state of Diablo 4, Overwatch, Warzone, Destiny, 2K, and more. The virality of that movement goes past the vocal minority and into the wider market. As economic strife and rising inflation make it more difficult for people to buy luxury goods, they're far more careful with their spending. They do their research. And when a simple Google search reveals how people just don't trust your game or your company, customers are far less likely to make purchases regardless of how you try to manipulate the market through nostalgia or through marketing. I brought this up many a times on my podcast, which is every Sunday, 2 p.m. PST, right here on YouTube, by the way. But crypto games never stood a chance, and they never will. And the reason why is because they are based on monetization. No matter what they do, they have to start from the monetization first because, well, it's in the name. It's a crypto game. It's not a game. It's a crypto game. And because of that, they'll never actually be anything. Because what game, what great game do you ever remember that they ever started from how are they going to sell it? How are they going to monetize it? The inspiration for most games that we've all enjoyed have always been somebody's great idea that it was something that they themselves were going to have fun playing. A valuable experience that they would enjoy. And that's the whole point of this video. That's the whole point of what this conversation should be is that we just want to have valuable experiences and have our time valued for playing the games that we get. Now, I've seen a lot of people try to parse out and say, you know, I give a dollar per hour value for the games that I play. You know, if it's a $70 game and I get 70 hours out of it, then yeah, you know, that's that that was that was a good game. No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Did you actually value the time that you spent in that game? Will you remember it? Was it enjoyable? There's tons of games that you can spend 60 and $70 on and not enjoy. It doesn't mean you got your money out of it. It's not how that works. I just want good games. That's all we want. We just want our time valued. We want the money that we spend for the game, but we want it to actually mean something in the first place. 
it's really not that complicated. And I don't understand how it's so hard to be able to communicate that to the developers and all of these different conversations that we've had. I want to experience what it was like playing Halo for the first time again, or adventuring in Elden Ring, or Ocarina of Time. It's really not that hard. And I don't understand why they're making it that hard. Other than they just want to make it seem that way so that we just keep giving them money and that they can take advantage of us. And if that's the case and that's what they're going to continue to do and that's the path that they want to choose to take, that's fine. But they will fail. Because we will go places to actually get valuable experiences. Your Call of Duty will stop being purchased once somebody makes a game that has a far more valued design. Something that the players enjoy more and doesn't take advantage of them. Same thing goes for RPGs, ARPGs, strategy games, puzzle games, it doesn't matter. Every single genre that's out there, the next time that there's a game that comes out from somebody else that's not taking advantage of the players, that provides a better experience because you have lost the vision of what it's like to make good games and not think about how you're going to drain the player for every cent they have, you'll lose business. And if you continue, you'll lose yours. That's all I got today. I just wanted to kind of clear this up. I wanted to talk about this for a little bit. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, I got some more articles and stuff that I'm going to probably cover maybe next week. I have a review for Baldur's Gate 3 that I'm going to do. I'm calling it a casual gamer's review. That's my thing. I'm going to be the casual gamer. Um, make sure you guys follow me on Twitch if you guys haven't before. Subscribe to the channel if you guys haven't. I hope you guys have been enjoying the videos lately. I hope you guys have been having a great day uh, or have a great day. Uh, stay cool. Stay righteous. Stay safe, my friends. And uh, yeah. Yeah.